Uh, thank you for coming today. This I'm here representing Jerry Daniels. Uh, Jerry Daniels grew up in the Helmville, Ovando area, not too far from here, and moved to Missoula with his family when high school started because there wasn't a high school up in that area. Uh, he graduated from Missoula County High School and during his, I think it was his senior year, maybe it was his junior year, anyway he was just barely 17 when he uh, became a Missoula smoke jumper. So as far as we know he was the youngest person, he was just barely beyond 16 years old to become a smoke jumper here. Uh, two of his older brothers had been smoke jumpers before him and two years later, uh, because he started in 58, two years later in 1960, just as the Vietnam War was starting to percolate, uh, it was 1960 and the CIA sent recruiters out to the smoke jumper base in Missoula and in McCall, Idaho because they were looking for young men with certain skills. Those who knew parachutes, knew cargo, knew how to kick cargo, how to rig cargo, knew airplanes, knew how to jump, uh, and the smoke jumpers knew all of that and how to survive in rough terrain. <clears throat> so Jerry, along with a good number of other smoke jumpers out of these two bases, were very quietly recruited by the CIA. They were all single, they were all young, and they all thought an adventure overseas sounded pretty interesting. Uh, they didn't really know where they were going. They suspected it might be Southeast Asia. Uh, and sure enough, that is where they ended up. They all were also very good at keeping their mouths shut. So some of them would jump here during fire season and then go back overseas again. Uh, they started out as cargo kickers for Air America, which was a CIA proprietary airline. It means owned and operated by the CIA. Uh, flying out of the bases in Udorn, Thailand, and some of the other bases in Thailand. Basically, they were uh, cargo kickers dropping into these very remote areas of Laos. Uh, where there was not a big enough airstrip for anybody to land and so they were dropping in that. Uh, some of the smoke jumpers stayed with cargo kicking um, and Jerry was one of the few that decided that he really liked it overseas, uh, really enjoyed Southeast Asia and he was interested in working more on the ground with the people. Um, so he talked to the agency about that and was told, okay, he could become a junior case officer, but in order to move up in the organization, he would need to come back and take some more classes and get a college degree. So for the next several years, off and on, he came back to the University of Montana in Missoula and was studying here. He'd save his money, he'd come back, he'd do a semester, he'd go back overseas. It was somewhat random the way he got through college, but he did graduate in 1969 and became a full senior CIA case officer. Uh, he had been working on the ground in Laos that whole time, but now he moved into the heartland which was the secret air base that was at Long Chang Laos uh, in northern Laos. That was the site where General Von Pao was stationed and eventually he became the personal case officer and advisor, American advisor, to General Von Pao. Uh, he was there through the very difficult war years. He worked very closely with the Hmong soldiers uh, who were all fighting uh, on behalf of the Lao government but with the same agenda as the U.S. government uh, because the Ho Chi Minh Trail ran through Laos um, a lot of what they did was to stop the North Vietnamese coming into South Vietnam uh, and Jerry was heavily involved with all those soldiers they took a real beating in Laos so while the 
war in Vietnam was very public and all of us knew about it on the television and the newspapers, the war in Laos was secret. It was run only by the CIA uh, and there were no or very, very few American military that were on the ground, but there were these CIA case officer advisors that were working very quietly throughout the whole country. Uh, with the local indigenous troops that were there. In 1975, uh, Saigon fell at, at the end of April, and two weeks after that, uh, there was this massive air evacuation from Saigon. Two weeks after that, Jerry was the only American left on the ground in northern Laos. He was the one who orchestrated and organized a secret, because everything was secret in Laos, uh, air evacuation of General Vang Pao and about 2,500 Hmong officers, soldiers, and their families from Longcheng, Laos to northern Thailand. That was the beginning of the refugee movement. Um, there were already tanks up on the ridge line. It was too dangerous to continue any longer. So many, many Hmong over the next 10 years were filtering out of Laos that had been involved during the secret war in Laos. Because of that, once Jerry was out of Laos and he was personally responsible for getting General Van Pao out. It was either they were both going to die or they were both going to survive. There was no way he was leaving without the general. And he was successful, obviously. General Van Pao uh, in 1975 did come to the U.S. and ended up in the Bitterroot Valley uh, on a farm down there. Um, Jerry went back to Thailand and was on loan to the State Department from the CIA because he was the only one who had been working with the Hmong consistently since 1960. He knew the battles, he knew the, the commanders, uh, he had all kinds of tricky questions that he could ask those soldiers to figure out who was a bona fide um, soldier that had worked on, uh, as a pro-American troops, you know. Anyway, so he did the interviews with the refugees, the Hmong refugees that were in Thailand. That continued for another eight years, uh, and he was very, very good at that job. He was, by 1982, he was starting to think about coming back to Missoula, uh, where he had lots of friends, some of whom have shown up today, uh, and family, and uh, some of his Hmong friends were here also. He was thinking about that quite seriously and in uh, April, end of April 1982, uh, a body was found in his apartment in Bangkok. Uh, it was not recognizable. It was quite disfigured, uh, not recognizable and the U.S. Embassy called the local Thai police department to come and pick up the body. This is odd, I think, because Jerry had worked for the CIA. He was working probably still for the CIA and officially for the State Department. He was a U.S. Embassy employee. He was an American citizen. Um, and why the embassy called the Thai Police Department to handle the investigation of his death strikes me as questionable. Uh, the paperwork that the Thai provided was done very quickly. It was sent back to the embassy. Everything was good. Everything was matched. This was Jerry. A body was put into a casket and that casket was permanently sealed, never to be opened. Uh, and then it was shipped here to Missoula. Uh, and here we are today. 
that casket was not opened. Jerry had worked with the Hmong community, the Hmong soldiers, for so many years, both in Laos and in Thailand, that when uh, the casket arrived here, he was extremely uh, honored by the Hmong community. They had a traditional three-day Hmong funeral ceremony for him here in Missoula. Uh, and, and the casket went into the ground as is. It was not opened. Uh, because uh, Jerry's mother said, no, if the government wants us to keep it closed, we will do that. But questions continue. Uh, he led a very interesting and adventuresome life. And uh, maybe some of you read the book reviews that have been in the Missoulian this summer. So uh, I wrote a, bi a biography of him that talks both about his life and about the Hmong funeral ceremony, which is long and interesting, I think. Uh, and so I, I have a few of those here today. But if there are questions, I, I will do my best to answer them. I have a question. Yes. That picture that's on the... Ah. What is that? This is as close as they could do because nobody had a photograph. This is the Longcheng Airport, uh, the secret CIA base. There's the runway. Uh, this is the general's house and where the, the CIA was located up there. Uh, he, he loved hunting, so these are actually, you know, Canada goose over there. That, that has nothing to do with Laos. And this says Longcheng in Lao, in Lao script. Uh, Mr. Hogg was his radio code name, uh, and it was supposed to be Hogue, from Ferret Hogue, which is a whole family story that we won't get into, but uh, the Hmong couldn't say Hogue, they could only say Hogg, and so he said, okay, that, that works for me, I'll be Mr. Hogg. And so they called him Mr. Jerry or Mr. Hogg the whole time he was working with them. And you may have started with this, but how, um, how did you come to be interested in him? Because I worked, how did I become interested in him? I started working with Vietnamese refugees in California immediately after the fall of Saigon and about a year later the very first Hmong were coming in and I really really liked them. I knew not, they said they were from Laos but I knew that couldn't be true because what did Laos have to do with the Vietnam War? Um, and then of course eventually I found out yes it was a secret war that went on in Laos. So, were his remains ever positively identified? Were his remains positively <laughs> identified? Only by the Thai Police Department they were positively identified. No, in other words. Uh, the autopsy report that was sent back to the family, four pages long with every single line blacked out. That's him right there. <laughs> and this is Dan. He couldn't eat that much. <laughs> he this is eat that much, but Jerry's did. brother, uh, and he has another story to tell. Well, before uh, uh, this thing here is Operation Cold Feet. This happened in '82. The jumpers and CIA guys in Marana, Arizona, developed this way of. And if you've seen John Wayne's uh, Green Berets, they send up a balloon, which is back here, and this B-17 or whatever B number it is, has a big V on the front of it. They developed this in Arizona to pick up our astronauts out of the ocean. And it gets down to the V, turns like this, turns a couple of hooks, and it's on a nylon line that's 300 feet long. And it stretches so far that it lays right on the belly of the plane. And the winch man down here, which Jerry was the winch man, then they'd reel him up. They developed this for that, those astronauts 
and our wise government said, show these guys what you can do. They said, well, it's not developed all the way. You show them what to do. He said, it's too windy. I don't know what will happen. Not just Jerry, but the whole crew. And most of them were smoke jumpers. And so they set up a dummy and snap, came by, snapped this guy up, and he whammed into some trees and fences and some uh, bleachers. And <laughs> these astronauts says, we don't want to get picked up by that thing. <laughs> so to my knowledge, this operation here, which was in the Arctic, picking up uh, Russian intel. That's a Russian camp that's down here. Their uh, ice runway was starting to collapse with their with the pressure crack. They told them to get out, so the Russians got out. And there was left a lot of intel. Of course, it, we, everybody says it was weather intel that they were picking, but it was probably listening to our submarines running in what directions and all that kind of stuff. So they dropped two really smart guys from the Navy, admirals, I know I don't think they were admirals, but Lashak, who was on that book down there, was there and they picked up for all, they worked on them for two days getting all this stuff. There was pictures of these Russians families, they, their food, their cigarettes, their alcohol was still at this place when they picked it all up. And these guys went through quite a stories and it was really low visibility with the fog and and uh, blind, or in clouds and they didn't the, these guys here didn't know where they were so they decided to go up and take a shot with the sun because they're so close to the North Pole that their compasses didn't make any difference they got up and they were eight miles from Russia which is not a pleasant thing to be when you're in a cold war with Russia but they got these guys out and this is no uh, well that was in 62 and that he died in 82 so he was just 21 years old and he and that bunch of guys that he was with that developed this thing here that that happened and my wife and I were flown back my brother and his daughter were flown back to the CIA to receive a posthumous posthumously awarded medal for the all these guys their names are some of their names are on the bottom one of the pilots lives down in in Corvallis and the guy in the nose of the plane you can just see a little smudge there he lives up in Ovando half the year the other half is in Texas and so they're still around but those guys of that era we're a different brand of people, just like we don't fight fires nowadays like we did then. They'd see a fire, they'd drop two or three jumpers on it and kill the fire within a day or so. Now they let it burn for a while and then they have a different way of going about it. Now they're worried more about human life and, and buildings, which is just a different way of fighting the, the fires. But these guys, they were sent back there, they had to backpack their stuff out, they were in good shape. And they had to think for themselves. I mean, if they got if somebody got hurt, they had to take care of them, to get them out of there. So that's why they used Jerry and these other jumpers that were of that in the 50s era in Laos, and because they could think and make things work, like a good old rancher or farmer. You couldn't go to town every day. You fixed it, or you made something to make that <coughs> piece of machinery work. Are there any questions on that? Don't be afraid to ask any kind of a question you want. Whether he's in that hole or not, I don't know. <laughs> they say that there was something like 92% carbon monoxide in his blood. My older brother Jack, and it really is Jack Daniels, there's just no apostrophe down there. <laughs> he's a doctor of physiology, and he tested high altitude runners for their use of oxygen and how much carbon monoxide they emit. And they used to black each other out and they'd black out at about 50% carbon monoxide in their blood. Now they're talking 42 more percent. That guy should have blacked out if he had 92%. Why didn't... How did he get that high? Is it 
some deal that they said, well, we'll just put that down and nobody will ever check. Of course, now you couldn't find out. So that is one of the Jack is looking into right now about the possibility that there is a large discrepancy there. Whether we dig him up, we don't know. <coughs> Many questions, and uh, yes, we don't have, it's a lot of things we don't have answers for, but we'll start again at the beginning in a couple of minutes if, uh, if there are no more questions. Feel free to mill around. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome.